So I'm Alexis Neely, and you might know me as Ali Shanti, and I'm here today with my friend George Cow, and we're here having this conversation because there's been a lot of dialogue in the online world about business models and what is really the best business model for each person and how do we choose that business model. And You know, George and I had a conversation um, some time ago because I noticed that the business model that George has chosen was one that oftentimes calls to me. And I'll see him posting about how he left the internet marketing world and he gave up promoting his programs and courses just, you know, to work with people one on one. And It's something that I've been resistant to myself. I've invested so much time and energy and attention in building my business models online and then ultimately even building a program to help people choose the right business model for them. And yet, as I build these big teams, I notice this draw to do what George has done and let it all go and just work with people one-on-one. And so I wanted to have a conversation with George because really I wanted to explore that and what led into his decision to leave the world of online marketing or, um, you know, leverage and um, uh, selling, you know, online programs and courses and instead give up his time in this one-to-one way really as a way of Um, helping me to get more clear on whether that might be something that I wanted to do. And I really respect George. He and I have done work together over the years. um, And I've just seen that the way that George serves his community is really heartfelt. Um, I I specifically didn't use the word heart-centered because I think that that word has gotten watered down Mm. and it doesn't really mean a lot anymore, yeah. um, but but I feel George's heart, mm. so I say heartfelt, and I'm really excited to be here with you, George, having this conversation that we can share with more people who might be in this inquiry for themselves about how do I choose the right income model for me? How do I know if I should invest in the program that's going to teach me how to do a product launch, and should I create a course, and you know, really what is my next level? And I think that this is a great space for us to have a, an open and honest conversation that can help a lot of people who are considering going down the path that we have. And we've chosen different things. And uh, also maybe it can help to give me more clarity on uh, what I'm continuing to choose and maybe give you more clarity on what you're continuing yeah. to choose. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. That was great. Um, so. I am excited about this conversation because, Ali, you and I, like uh, you mentioned, we've known each other for years. We first got to working together because I was in the internet marketing world of joint ventures, doing big webinars, selling big ticket uh, programs, you know, $2,000 a piece, you know, where people didn't even have one-to-one access to me, you know, for $2,000, they had some group access. Um, and then I so admired you and I still do because you have been so successful in that world. Uh, you built a successful, you built, you have more businesses than I think I, I understand, but, uh, you have a successful business, uh, in law and you have a successful business teaching lawyers how to build their practice and succeed there. And then you, um, had a successful business teaching business owners how to relate to the legal piece in their business, Mm -hmm. whether they should incorporate and and why and all that good stuff. And then you went and developed a whole program that was successful called the money map, right? And you help people discover what the different models were for sharing their gifts online and how to relate to the money piece of it. And I I've seen you over the years become more, of a spiritual leader, I might say, uh, mm. to your community anyway. Um, even though it's not your product or your service, um, I feel like you are a, um, it, it is, it's spiritual leadership into, in, into 
a way of authenticity is, is what I would, is what I felt is mm -hmm. like, how do we become more radically, um, uh, aligned with, uh, what, what the, what the heart really wants to express mm -hmm. through our business. So I kind of saw that more and more from you. And recently, uh, we reconnected because I saw a posting that you had made on Facebook about how you are writing a new book about money in the context of what is enough and you're creating a program around that. And interestingly, I saw it because I was visiting James Altucher's profile and he's a, he's a blogger and podcaster. I think that we both admire. I really like his podcast and, uh, you had tagged him. He had liked your post. Um, you had also tagged several people, including Charles Eisenstein. You mentioned him and Lynn Twist. And these are both people I admire for their, um, uh, you might say, radical way of thinking about money in this world. But I think it's radical only because the way that we do it right now, I think is pretty screwed up. <laughs> The way that the economy is uh, designed, really designed, or it keeps funneling money more and more, and more money and more power to the people at the top, uh, and leaving a lot of people, um, including many of the people that that we know, mm -hmm. and many of our clients and our colleagues, um, and sometimes ourselves as well, um, lacking because uh, community, you know, the, the 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 sense of community has largely disappeared unless we create our own. And I know that you've been um, quite effective at creating your own community and network. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is partly that, I think that's part of this conversation too, is in order to, for us to be able to um, thrive in a new economy, which is what the, the term you've been using in a new economy, I think it requires us to uh, be especially cognizant about how we are building community again um, in a way that even though we don't live with each other in a village, we don't, we don't live in a neighborhood together, how can we um, really diligently and actively um, maintain and deepen these bonds that we have virtually, you and I have never met in person, how can we do this um, in a way that we can truly be supportive of each other and we can build a, an ecosystem where um, no, you know, uh, spiritual entrepreneur, you might say, gets left behind, yeah. you know. So anyway, I, I kind of want to preface that uh, with, with this idea of, of, of community. Yeah. yeah. Well, I love that about our last conversation and I'd love to explore that a little bit more because one of the things that you had said is you, you know, as you've gone into doing more of this one-on-one -on -one work with people, you also wonder how we can still come together to support each other. And I'd love to just give people some insight into the way that it has happened in the past. Yes. The thing that, that you stopped doing, um, mm. you know, participating in these big joint venture launches and mm. these big, like, um, partnership networks and um, because in a way you might say that those are communities of people who are coming together to support each other right. in right. bringing their programs and products out to the world. Mm -hmm. But I think probably what you might have noticed there and wanted to pull away from and consciously pulled away from and something that I personally have also struggled with and might be why my work isn't more out in the world is that what I've seen with those communities is that they, um, first of all, they're, they're exclusive. Yeah. Um, they're very exclusive. Mm. You can like only get into them if you have a certain list size. Right. Yeah. And then the, the way that the community exists that's been painful to me personally mm. is that it's really based on this competition mentality. Right. And if you get into the back end of these joint venture launches, what you'll see is that the way that the, the joint venture partners are incentivized mm. to email their list and to support the launch is by setting up these competitions right. 
right. among the partners. And right. I will be honest, I have gotten pulled into those. Sure. And yeah, my competition self has gotten activated in a way that I would email my list more because I wanted to win or I wanted right. to be on the leaderboard. Yes, yes. And ultimately, I began to recognize that that was actually painful to mm. me. Um, the part of me that was activated mm. participating in those launches wasn't the part of me that I love the most. Mm. It wasn't the part of me that I feel where I feel my heart the most, where I was really making a choice about whether to send an email or not. Yeah. It's done. Do I really think that this thing is the best thing out there in the world or do I just want to win this competition? And so I pulled away from it, but it's hurt my business. Yes. Right. To do it, you know, uh, in many ways. And I, and you, you changed your whole business model. You said, okay, well, I'm going to serve people one-on-one. -on -one. I'm not going to, I'm not even going to participate in this more right. anymore. Right. I have not. I kept my business model mm -hmm. serving people with my courses and programs and products. And we can talk more about why we each, you know, chose that. Yeah. I'd love to hear what your experience has been with these kinds of communities, why that didn't work for you and what you would prefer to see. Yeah. So great. I'm, I you said you it described that world so well. Um, it's very masculine, um, very, uh, it's almost like you can imagine sports teams or, um, you know, sort of everyone's showing off their muscles or something like that, you know, uh, their muscles being their list and their ability to write copy that converts. Um, so, it, it's, yeah, and I'm thinking, you know, back to the masculine, it's kind of like people have list envy, like, what? You have 100,000 people on your list, and oh, your conversion rate is this, you know? Yeah. And I think why, what um, no longer worked for me about it was um, the, I think, myopic focus on certain numbers. It was list size, it was, you know, how much you sold. And that's pretty much it um, to the exclusion of was your, like you said, was your audience truly served by this? Do you really believe in it? In other words, to the exclusion of the heart, mm -hmm. um, to the exclusion of the heart of service and also the authentic um, endorsement from our, from our in, intrinsic motivation instead of the extrinsic motivation. So, I, um, and also you couldn't, the other thing is you can't be part of that community unless you're essentially scratching each other's back. It's like, well, you know, Ali, I'm only going to promote you if you promote me. Yeah. No matter if my thing is right for your audience or not, maybe your thing is right for my audience, but you got to promote me regardless, you know? And if that's, and so I could no longer um, tolerate promoting things to my audience that I felt were basically taking their money and not really giving the average buyer uh, what the hype was promising. Mm. Um, I think that was the key. The, um, there, along this journey, there have been a couple of um, models that have been, that have been people that have been, have have shocked me by their sincerity in, in the way they do their business. And I would say, by the way, you said it's hurt your business. And I would say it's only hurt your business maybe in one way, which is maybe some of the numbers. But in another way, you might say that it's helped your business maybe for the longer term mm -hmm. in that you are drawing more of the people to you that you actually want to be with long term in terms of clients, customers, and partners. Right. Um, and maybe right now in the short term, the business numbers are not as, as, as great. But if we are able to look at the, the long game, um, I do believe that we'll look back and say that was the right choice mm -hmm. or that was the choice that I'm so glad that I made, yeah. even though it was scary at the time. But one of the models I want to bring up and I, I also want to hear about the models that the people that kind of inspired you along the way. Uh, one of the folks is uh, Leo Babauta mm -hmm. of zenhabits.net. I remember reading 
one of there's several of his postings, which if, if if I can find it, I'll include it in the notes of this uh, of this episode. One of the uh, posts he wrote was basically giving advice on how he was able to 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 do so well in his business. I mean, he has over a million readers of his blog regularly. Um, subscribers probably in the hundreds of thousands in terms of email. He lives in San Francisco, supports a family of six. And he barely sells on his blog. He does sell, does do launches every now and then. But his 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 words and his contact are very much aligned. And he he says basically, shockingly to me, don't worry about SEO. <laughs> like ignore ignore social media, ignore SEO. Do what is right for the audience, for your audience. Does it help your reader? Make all your decisions based on that question. When he, when I read that. I was still in the JV world and I was shocked by that. I'm like, how is this guy able to create such a successful business um, with that kind of, with that kind of mandate? Mm. And eventually, and I am starting to see that to be honest. I mean, Ali, I feel like I just started my business over again in the past year or two mm. from scratch. And I feel like my, my audience, I'm, it's like I'm, I'm developing relationships with a new group of people. There were some from, the, from my old life, my old business life, that have now seen my transformation and are interested in participating. But I feel like I'm really creating a new tribe. And mm -hmm. I have never before seen this kind of loyalty from my audience before. Um, and mm. I feel like it's an intrinsically motivated loyalty. They're not trying to get to me and, and trying to get me to promote them or something like that. It's a, wow, I really connect with you in your heart. I believe in what you're doing and that's why I'm supporting you. Yeah. But what, what have you, um, what have you seen in the transformation uh, in your transformation in terms of how you're relating to your audience? Have you seen any, any difference there? Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 the biggest challenge for me, George, has yeah. been my incongruence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And That's me too. What what I what I notice, um, and this does come back to really knowing knowing your audience, like you're saying. Mm. But that starts with knowing yourself. Mm. And as I've gone through my own personal transformation, I haven't always known myself. I've been torn between these two worlds of Alexis Neely and Ali Shanti. And it's only been really recently, um, I would say in the past year that I have felt an integration between these two parts of me that are allowing um, uh, a sense of congruence. So when I'm speaking to my audience, sometimes I'm speaking really clearly about the heart. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'm still speaking a lot about money. Yeah. And I got an email message recently, which I shared with you the last time we talked from a man who was on my email list. And he said, please unsubscribe me. Um, mm -hmm. I don't feel your heart in these emails. Mm -hmm. These emails are all about money and freedom being the path to success. Right. And I don't believe that is the path to success. And I want to hear from Allie. Um, who, you know, I believe knows that love and truth are the path to success. And I want you to show us a model where we can just give everything away for free and we don't need to charge for anything and we can trust that we're going to have what we need. Right. And this email was the perfect reflection of my own internal incongruence on these issues. Mm. I agree with him. In yeah. so many ways, yeah. yes, I want to live in a world where we can all just give our gifts for free and trust that we're going to receive everything that we need back in return. Mm. But we don't live in that world right now. Right. And the part, the Alexis Neely part of me knows that I would be leading people, or at least feels that mm. I would be leading people astray if I were to say, hey, just... Give everything that you have away for free and don't charge for your services. And if I wasn't showing people ways that they can give their gifts and yeah. ask for what they need back yeah. in return, yeah. that is actually truly what they need. And so, you know, this idea of 
speak to your audience and always only write to your audience right. begins really with you truly knowing who mm -hmm. is that audience, who right. are you to begin with, you know, like really knowing yourself deeply and then coming from the most congruent place that you can in each moment. That's mm -hmm. really been my biggest challenge is that mm -hmm. I have an internal conflict yeah. that I'm wrestling with yeah. and I'm not hiding it. You know, mm -hmm. I'm not like, well, I'm going to hide this internal conflict mm -hmm. until I've resolved it. Yeah. One of the things that I longed for 10, 15 years ago was I wanted to see people in process and yeah. not just after they've become successful. I wanted to see like, what was it like when they were, you know, still figuring things out. And so I share that. And for some people, and I guess I just have to trust that the people who don't respond well to that aren't my people. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think that the more congruent you can get with the truth of who you are and then speak from that place, mm -hmm. the more you are going to find that audience. And so I, I guess the question that I have for you, George, is who is your audience? You know, you say that you've, you've gotten into this clarity around this new tribe that you're creating. And um, <clears throat> one of the first things that, of course, we teach whenever we're teaching someone to build their business is know who you're serving. Right. It's the hardest thing for most people because we want to serve the world. Yeah. Um, you know, when I was doing estate planning, like I, I serve everybody because everybody needs estate planning. But the truth is, is when I went through Michael Port's programs way back when, and I got really clear that, you know, I'm going to serve families with young children. Mm. And I was willing to make the commitment to that yeah. and build a business around serving families with young children, even though all the other lawyers said, Alexis, don't do that. You're going to starve. Families with young children don't want to do estate planning. They don't want to think about death. They don't want to pay for it. But I knew as a mom, yes, they do. You just haven't been talking to them in the right way. And I went for it. That's when my business exploded. So this is the right question to ask. Yeah. Who is your audience? Yes. And I'm curious for you, George, what you've discovered in this kind of rebuilding of your business and discovering this new tribe. Who, who is your audience? Yeah. yeah. Oh my gosh, it is such an ongoing inquiry for me too. Um, in fact, I, uh, I, I always tell people that, listen, you don't define your audience once and then you're done. Uh, I think that you're continually, um, hopefully having conversations with them to discover what is it, wh what's, what stage are, there at, are they at that you can best help them um, what is it that they are, um, well, in conflict with in their own hearts, right? Um, and not even, I feel like I used, to, I used to think that my audience was a particular, well, it's either women or men or, or people of a particular, gen, uh, particular age range, rather. And I feel like my new audience is not. It's, it's confusing to me. I, and I think in part, um, Ali is I am not quite sure who my new audience is yet, you know, because I feel like I just started my business over again after five, six years, like new business, same kind of stuff I'm talking about, but talking about in a new, with a, with a new heart and essentially with a new, therefore with, if I'm talking with a new heart, I'm connecting with, with a, with a, from a different place. And so I'm connecting with new people. Um, I do, I do notice that, I think maybe it's because we're in this uh, political season right now that my audience tends to um, connect with certain, you know, political values um, and we can kind of connect there or maybe it's the love of animals or, uh, and at the same time, they really love, and I'm so glad that Facebook now has this like, love, you know, different reactions yeah. to our posts. They love um, when I talk about the things that we're talking about here. You yeah. Know? And so I'm getting a sense that that is my audience. And, and I think that that encourages me to keep talking about it, mm -hmm. to not shy away from it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and so on this question of business model, yeah. on this question of could we give everything away and still be taken care of, I am now experimenting. Um, I don't know if you've saw my thread on this yet in Wisdompreneurs, but I'm experimenting with Patreon. Yeah. 
uh, I am now moving all my client billing over to Patreon in a radical move. Uh, you know, it's still early. I don't know if it's going to pan out. You know, we'll have to check in on this experiment in six months. Um, thus far, I've gotten about $1,000 a month moved over to Patreon, and, which is interesting because it's more money than most people are making on Patreon. Mm -hmm. Um, but my, the idea for those of you who don't know, Patreon is a platform where content creators can ask their audience can be supported financially by their audience. So if you saw a YouTube, a YouTube video creator, you know, maybe this sort of the, the, um, traditional way of thinking about Patreon is this person, you know, sing songs on YouTube. You love it so much. You want to support their next song. Uh, cause they're a poor musician and you know, they say, okay, I've set up my Patreon page. Please go and support me there. Maybe you can chip in $2 per song that I upload or the other model on Patreon is a monthly support and the monthly support is what I'm using. Right? So, because I work with clients, uh, on a month to month basis and, you know, certain number of sessions per month, that kind of thing. So I told, I actually <laughs> took the, I was proactive in canceling my my current clients paypal subscriptions without asking them first i actually canceled their paypal subscriptions and i said please do me a favor click this link instead and let's move our billing over there so the ones that i canceled actually did move move over there i had some clients that have already paid me lump sum so those are not reflected on my monthly amount but it's it's very interesting um, that there is some amazing clarity i'm getting from wow I'm making a thousand dollars a month recurring. Um, and my clients, you know, um, I'm still serving them the same way. It's just the billing's different, but the, the framing of the, the money is different too. It's not, it's now framed as I'm financially supporting George at a certain level. And on Patreon, there is, you can set up reward rewards for certain levels. Like, if you chip in $75 a month, you get access to this. If you chip in $350 a month, you get access to that. And so it's like, oh, I'm now supporting George financially because the way my Patreon page is, is um, framed is that um, I'm creating free courses to help people build their authentic business. Mm. So that's my mission on my Patreon pages. I'm giving away all my content away for free. That's my commitment to them. And if they want to support me, they support me. But really, the majority of the money has been from my clients. Uh, I've just moved the billing over there. But I'm starting to see people support me because they want to, even though they don't get any of the reward levels. So my experiment and hope is that this will work. And I think that um, if this works, maybe it'll work for uh, others who want to pursue this path too, that could we um eventually i want the money my money mainly to be from people who just love my content and want to want to chip in i mean in the meantime i think the the compromise the middle solution is oh i'm still mainly making money doing the one-to-one -one service but the, the dream of course just like the email you mentioned is could we eventually just be sharing our brilliant gifts i mean ali i i think if you had a patreon page i would pledge ah uh. You know, because I think your I think your um, your spirit and um, the way that you want to transform the world is amazing, right? And I, I imagine there's others who 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 love your your um, your message, who love who you are, and would love to do that as well, right? Mm. So that's a that's an experiment. I'm always experimenting, and and I'm just interested to see where it goes from here. So what I'm what I'm hearing is that even though you left the online world where you were you didn't leave the online world, obviously, here we are yeah. online, yeah. Um, and we reconnected on Facebook, so you are in the online world, but you left this world of internet marketing, hardcore sales, joint venture partnerships, and transitioned into serving people on a one-to-one -one basis. Mm -hmm. what, what you really would like is a reality where you are creating consistent content that can serve more people than you can serve one-to-one. -one. Yes. You do want that. Yeah, so, so similar to what you're, um, so you're, you're also wishing to 
have a positive impact on more people's lives because you believe in your message. Yeah. And the same thing with me is that that's what I want as well. I think when it comes to content, there's, I mean, I guess there's kind of three things that I, I know I need to work on. One, of course, is the quality of the message itself. Mm -hmm. uh, so sort of the efficacy of the tools, processes, et cetera. Second one is the, well, the, the production value or the entertainment value of the message. Uh, and the third one is really the distribution relationships um, that that's, I think, part of the ecosystem idea that I'm talking about is if we can form an ecosystem of people who believe in each other, then it's much easier for our message to spread and help the people that it needs to help. Mm -hmm. Right. And I feel like I have a long way to go in, in all three of these areas. Mm -hmm. you know? And I feel like I'm just starting again. Yeah. Um, and, but I think that if, if we all work on these things for ourselves, we have a message that's out there that's really helping people that's easy to consume because it's, it's good production value or it's entertaining and it's being distributed to us from people we trust. Okay. Because maybe it's someone else we hadn't heard of. And now, now we get to, we get that message from someone we trust. Um, and if everyone is kind of getting their lives benefit in this way um, and they are supporting and so I, I, I talk about reciprocal gratitude, you know, I mean, the, there's sustainable generosity and then there's reciprocal gratitude. I think about it this way, like sustainable generosity is we are recording this video. We're hoping that it'll help many people, but we don't have to have the same conversation with a thousand people. Mm -hmm. We can have this conversation once. Right. And I think that's sustainable generosity, right? Yeah. And reciprocal gratitude is if the person who is watching and listening truly benefits from it and feels an overflow in their heart and saying, gosh, I want this overflow to benefit the people that I've just received the benefit from. Mm. And they know that, okay, they can go support you, Ali. They can go support me um, at whatever level is comfortable for them. Mm. Then truly everybody wins. Mm -hmm. They win. Mm -hmm. They win because they receive the generosity from us. But they win also because they get to give back. It doesn't just, it's like a river that gets to go somewhere. Yeah. There's somewhere for that heart to go. And then the world wins because of this model of um, mutual support. Yeah. So that's kind of my dream. And it's going to take us a while, I think, to get there. <laughs> well, but, this, is, yeah. this is one step closer. And, and here's what I want to identify. Because what you identified about the efficacy of the message, yeah. the production value, and then yeah. the community supporting each other, right. you might look at these preeminent marketers. Yeah. The Brendan Burchards, the Evan Pagan, right. Lisa Sasevich's, the Jeff Walkers. You guys have seen them all in your inboxes, right? Yes. yes. And you might say that the reason they are the preeminent mm. is because they have mastered yeah. those three things. Yeah, it's The true. efficacy of their message, They've mastered the production value. They all have really good production value. And they have created this network among themselves to um, promote each other. Mm -hmm. but, but there's a reason that both you and I, I haven't fully opted out. I want to I say that. I haven't fully opted out. Mm. I still do promote the things that feel really congruent yes. with where I am. If I personally benefited from it, mm -hmm. um, if I really do believe that my audience is going to benefit from it, yeah. and if the affiliate commission is sufficient for me to be willing to email my list. Mm -hmm. um, because we have a business that does uh, rely on making, you know, a certain amount of money for each time we send out an email. You have a team. I have a team. I have a, a, <laughs> team, big, to have a big team to support. Right. Yeah. So it's not just, you know, me, it's, it's this whole yeah. team that I'm supporting. Um, but there's something about that version of it. Yeah. That had you opt out and yeah. not want to play in that sandbox anymore. Yeah. And I'm curious what specifically yeah. it was yeah. that you see as addressed or could be addressed by what you're talking about here with sustainable generosity and reciprocal gratitude. Yeah. I think that there is something that will get us yeah. closer to the world we want to live in. So great. What a great question. Um, yeah, I, I, I think you're right that identifying the fact that the big internet marketers do have efficacy of message 
um, production value and the, and the community of, of distribution, distributing their messages and products. The thing, I think maybe there's a fourth one, I realize. I, I'm not sure if it's really part of efficacy or if it's fourth one, which is the efficacy, the, the impact of their message on the world for the longer term. Mm. Mm -hmm. The effect that their tools have on the, the holistic nature of the world and kind of where society needs to go, that was what's missing for me. And that's what is missing for me. Uh, whenever I, sometimes, I mean, I, my job, like part of my job is I have to keep learning about marketing, right? For the sake of my clients. Yes. And it's hard. It, it's funny because it's hard for me to, I can almost sometimes not stomach reading yet another blog post that is so profit driven yeah. or listening to another podcast that's all about building our list. Yeah. Because that's that, that piece of, I don't even know how we can call it. It's almost um, the, well, we could say the heart, yeah. the heart intention is missing. Is missing. You know, and I want to listen to podcasts or I want to read blog posts where essentially, I mean, I mean, when I read it from you, for example, I feel the heart there. Mm. And so therefore it's much easier for me to learn mm. mm -hmm. that that's the piece that I want to bring. So maybe th that, and I feel like maybe the, the three things I talked about working on are the things I feel like I need to work on because I think that the, the piece of the heart intention has been so transformed for me that that is where uh, it's much easier for me to bring that now. Yeah. And I think that's much, and that hard intention is what is so, comes so easily to a lot of the people in our audience. Um, like you said, you know, the spiritual entrepreneurs, they just want to give everything away from a pure heart intention, but they haven't instituted, systematized a way of doing business that is going to support them financially. And I think, you know what, I'll have to say this. I think a lot of heart entrepreneurs, spiritual entrepreneurs, they do need to work on the efficacy of their, of their tools and their message. They need to work on their production value and they need to work on their community of support. And all mm. of that though takes financial resource to do. Yeah, you're you know, right. What, what, you're right. What, I'm, what I'm finding is that, you know, a lot of the people that I work with don't have a lot of money. Mm. And, and it is oftentimes because they are coming so much from their hearts and they do just want to give it all away. Yeah. Um, and they don't necessarily have the ability to mm -hmm. ask for what they need yeah. um, uh, because they've been so much in this mindset of just, well, let's just give it all away. Um, and m maybe not always valuing their time yes. appropriately. Right. Um, and I only know these things, by the way, because I, as I made this transformation myself into my own heart, I noticed how uh, it's almost in a way that I rejected the money piece for some time. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, what I and, and it's really the same message that this that this man gave me in the email. You know, it's yeah. it, it, it was like the pendulum swing away from well, we need to reject money right. in order to live love and truth. And what yeah. I'm seeing as I integrate into my own being is that it's not a rejection. We don't want to reject anything that, in fact, as we evolve our consciousness, we want to transcend and include, as Ken Wilber says in the integral studies. We want to, we want to utilize money for its right purpose, put money in its right place. Yes. Which has been, you know, so much of, of my work is discovering, well, what is its right place? Yeah. And what I'm discovering for myself is that its right place is as a fuel mm. to fuel our creative dreams and our heart projects mm. rather than being a compass telling us where to go. And I think what you are helping me to identify right now is that part of why I think that you pulled out of that industry and part of what has had me be like, oh, is that money is the compass right. driving these communities. Right. And what you and I are both wanting to see more of is how can we allow money to be the tool, the fuel mm -hmm. that fuels the engine, but isn't the compass telling us where to go or how to make our choices, um, that instead 
we're allowing our hearts to lead and allowing money and the mind to support the mission of the heart. All right, that's beautiful. And now I'd love to hear an example if you, if you can think of one, whether it's something that you've recently had to decide on, money being not, no, longer, you know, no longer being the compass, but being a tool. Has yeah. there been a situation uh, in your business right now that you've had to make that decision or can you imagine that decision? Yeah, it's happening every day, actually. As I enter into this um, inquiry about whether to work with people one-on-one again, mm. as, a, as an example, yeah. um, before, when I was making my decisions based on money, with right. money as my compass, right. it was a much easier analysis for me to say, well, I'll just you know, choose the business model that will make me the most money. Right, which is, which is actually what we're continually every day being inundated with from the blogs we read from the corporate media is that that is supposed to be the compass profit for yeah. business right right and so as i have um shifted my orientation from money as the compass to money as the fuel it's had to become this reorientation inside of me where i am First, I have to be really clear about the life that I want. Mm. How much time do I have mm. for work, for earning money, um, and for bringing my message into the world? But none of that can happen until I'm first engaged in the self-care mm. that I need to engage in to support myself, which, by the way, that you know, 15 years ago, I think I hired my first coach. I was uh, earning a six figure income as an associate in a law firm, Hmm. dream job. And yet I was, you know, it was like 27 years old success, you know, and I was miserable. And Hmm. I remember being really confused. I went to law school. I graduated first in my class. I got the job at the best law firm in the country and making the six figure paycheck, bought a house, have a baby, I'm married. How could I be miserable? What is wrong with me? Yeah. The American dream. I'm living it. Yeah. And uh, I hired this coach, even though back then coaching was really weird. And the voice in my head was like, you don't need no stinking coach. You're you graduated first in your class from Georgetown. What's this coach going to be able to tell you? And I was like, well, uh, but you're not happy. So you know, give this a shot. And the very first thing that she had me focus on when we were coaching, she's like, When's the last time you went to the dentist? When's the last time you got your haircut? When's the last time you got a massage? When's the last time you got a pedicure? And I was pissed. I was like, I did not hire you. And by the way, I was spending, I think at the time, $350 a month, which wow. even though I was making a six-figure paycheck was a huge amount of money for me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because I never spent $350 a month on me. Yeah. On my house, on my right. husband, on my baby, on right. you know taxes, all the things. But to spend that much money on me was right. unheard of. Yeah. And now she's talking to me about pedicures and massages. And I was really angry. And I was like, okay, I am, th- this is not what I'm paying you for. Yeah. She's like, actually, it is what you're paying me for. Because if you don't take care of yourself first, you're never going to be happy in your job. It doesn't matter what you're doing. You're simply not going to be happy. And once I actually started doing that, I started working out and I went to the dentist and got my first pedicure. I'd never actually had a pedicure before. I found that this creative channel opened up inside of me that ultimately led to me starting my own law practice that had never been on my horizon before. I couldn't even see any of that Mm. Um, because the truth was, is I, I wasn't meeting my needs for self-care. I wasn't, my inner self was actually not taken care of. And, and so as I go into the inquiry of, should I work with clients one-on-one, which, you know, by the way, when I, when I do work with clients one-on-one, you know, they pay me a lot of money um, to do that. It has to start. And it, it is, it's continuously starting, not with this question of how much money I can make, Mm -hmm. but this question of um, what really fits into my life Mm. and how does it feel 
for me to do that. Um, and what I notice is that I'm doing a lot of one-on-one -on -one work with people for free, you know, friends and yeah. Yeah. things like that, because it feels good. I really, yeah. want, I really yeah. do like working with people one-on-one. -on -one. It's, yeah. it's super rewarding. Yeah. Um, what I also notice, though, is that when I charge for it and I feel the obligation yes. to deliver yes. in a certain way, it's yes. at specific times, it actually doesn't feel good to me. Interesting. I start feeling resentful that I have to show up at a specific time right. in a certain way. I start to feel them being like, is this really valuable? And them questioning my value. And because they are paying me so much because my, my money map number, which is the amount of money that I need to receive right. for each hour that I'm getting paid to deliver a service just based on what my companies need from me is really high. Yeah. But I start to feel this feeling of like, oh God, I got to really deliver. Oh God, I, I, you know, I start taking personal responsibility for their results in a way that doesn't feel good. And that's what has mm. me not wanting to serve in the one-on-one. -on -one. And that's fascinating. Yeah. And, and I think it's, yeah, it's, it's really having me inquire about that dynamic right now. I've got, um, I could say three types of client relationships. The first type is the traditional, they pay me upfront, either lump sum or monthly. And we have a set number of sessions over the, over the course of a year. Great. You know, everyone understands that model. The second model is the complete reverse, which is the people that I support for free because they're my loyal fans and they ask me questions on Facebook. Like they comment on one of my videos saying, Oh, George, what a great video. I love this so much. But what do you think about this? I mean, how does that work? Right. And I, I out of an out, outpouring of, wow, they they like my video. They're engaged with my content and they have further questions. And we, we all know that, you know, well, we, we all should know that the questions from our loyal audience are like gold mm. because it tells us, it's a signal, I believe, from the universe through the market for what we should be creating and focusing on more of. Yeah. So I, I'm very happy to support them there. That's free. Uh, just do it in a sustainable way. Yeah. You know, yeah. I think that's, that's key. And then now I'm experimenting with third relationship, which is deferred payment coaching is what I call it. And it's where... I'm very clear with the people I'm working with in this way. My fee per session is actually double the fee for what people would pay if they were prepaying for coaching. But they don't, this deferred payment coaching clients, they don't pay that fee until their business is at a level that supports them fully. Mm. And and then they're able to make that payment without financial hardship. Wow. Ali, it has been a, t I have been having a blast with these clients. I love it. You're really uh, invested in them. Totally invested. And also I make them go through a very lengthy application. Uh, well, it's just in filling on a form online, but it's, it's, it's one person after filling out said that was harder than filling it out for Harvard. <laughs> like, <Okay. laughs> You're going to get the actual results. Yeah. That's, that's a little bit of a, um, because exaggeration, but I have them in the application think through what are your income? What, what is your current income? What are your expenses? How much would you need to make in order to be able to pay for coaching? What is your idea right now? Just based on before our coaching, what is your strategy right now for making that much and all that stuff? So that they have to think through things. And then, and then I tell them also that we don't have a set number of sessions. We only meet when you need to meet, when you have made real progress based on what we talked about last time. And so they're really, they're really valuing of my time. Mm. I'm really valuing of that precious session because we may or may not have another session. And it's great. Everyone seems to be – now. We're, I'm just starting, so I don't know if people are going to pay me yet. But <laughs> thus, <laughs> thus far, they've been so appreciative that they're saying, I, I'm going to, and, and I see them making, interestingly, more progress in one session, after one session, than my prepaid clients are 
in first, second, even third session. You are giving me a huge idea here. I, I love this. <laughs> I really love it because I do get, you know, people who message me, they're like, well, let me pay you after I'm successful. But I've had this feeling of um, knowing that there have been times when I wouldn't have been successful if I didn't have money on the line. Right. I wouldn't have pushed through my resistance if right. I didn't have money on the line. And yeah. so that's been a bit of um, a challenge for me. And well, okay, how can I, how can I make that work? And one of the things that I, one of the things that I do is I train money map masters. Mm. And so these are people who are trained in the money map process to take other people through the money map process since I'm not doing it one-on-one -on -one, and people do really need to go through it one-on-one -on -one often. Mm. And I, in order to become a trained money map master, you need to make a big payment up front. $5,000 mm -hmm. is what it was last time. Mm -hmm. And I've noticed that I want to be able to train money map masters who don't necessarily have that $5,000 up front. And I've been thinking about how, how could I do this in a way that has um, them be able to pay upon success right. in a way that's also sustainable for the business. Because yes. yeah. there is a lot of giving of my time, of our resources. Mm. Yeah. My one concern mm. is that if they don't have money on the line, yeah. that when the resistance comes up, they yes. won't push through it. Right. And I saw this with one of the Money Map Masters that I have in the program now. Mm. Um, she might be one of the most resistant people that I've ever met. And if she watches this, she'll be able to identify herself. Um, and at each juncture where I have seen her say, I want to quit, mm -hmm. I have coached her mm -hmm. through the resistance mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. keep moving forward, yeah. recognizing that everything that she's going through that has her want to quit and give up is what she's going to be supporting her clients with. And I'm curious if she would have pushed through the resistance yes. if she wasn't financially invested and what we could um, uh, uh, create as a replica yeah. of that. Yeah. If not, you know, because we want them to have the intrinsic motivation that you're talking about yes. and not the extrinsic, not reinforce this idea of having to have extrinsic motivation. So how can we create this sustainable generosity? Yeah. With the reciprocal gratitude yeah. that you're talking about and ensure that people keep showing up yes. through the resistance, even yeah. if they don't have money on the line. Wow. Yeah, that's it. That's the question. Yeah. The, the idea that came to me as you, were, as you were asking this is, well, one is a deadline mm -hmm. for when they would pay that money back. Yeah. Um, one of my clients uh, really dislikes the word deadline and she replaces it with lifeline. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's so appropriate because it is, it is a lifeline to pull them into a higher life. Right? So yeah. deadline is one. It's like, okay. Second one is I think there needs to be a serious application process. Yeah. It's not just anybody can sign up and pay later they have to go through a long application that not, not long for its own sake, but really detailed having them think through whether am I the right, am I the right fit for this kind of deferred payment situation and why am I the right fit and what, what, what am I willing to give? Yeah. And what am I going to do when I'm stuck and when that resistance comes up? So, I mean, I have them answer that question, right? And maybe there's interviews or whatever, but because I mean, your, your money map master's program is, higher price than kind of my deferred payment. So I think there needs to be a more serious application. And third, I think that um, there is something strange I've noticed when people pay money for, for a program, it's like their brain says, I've just completed something. I've accomplished something. Mm. And sometimes it means they actually have less motivation mm. to do the stuff because they're like, oh, I bought the program. Yeah. You know? And so like, did I, did, then I, I have to keep telling the clients just because you bought the program doesn't mean that you did the program. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so I've noticed with my deferred payment clients, it's kind of the opposite dynamic, which is that they haven't paid the money, but they know they need to pay the money. Mm -hmm. And so they're going to work hard. I feel like they're working harder to make sure they, they can pay the money back. 
Well, here's what I feel that you're doing, George, and I feel like you're doing it uh, in a way that I hope is going to pull people into their higher selves. Mm. And um, one of the things that I once heard Lisa Sasevich say that mm. was really has really stuck with me, and she said, when people are looking to get out of something, mm. they're going to find all the reasons to make you wrong. And you don't want to set that dynamic up with your clients. Mm -hmm. where they're looking for reasons to make you wrong or, mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and I'm, uh, and when she said that the way that I internalized it is that I, I took that, um, uh, to mean that when people pay me, they are often going and their resistance comes up. Mm -hmm. They're often going to find reasons to make me wrong mm -hmm. to maybe, you know, they get scared and they are in a money crisis moment and they want to get a refund or something like that. Right. And they don't want to set up that dynamic. And I, I had a private coaching client I worked with about a year ago and she said to me, she said, Oh yeah. Um, all of my students have to go through this process of wanting to kill the teacher, kill the guru. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and she just knows that that's going to happen. But I, I would like to shift that dynamic. Yeah. And, and, and I think that what you are offering here is the potentiality to shift that dynamic and that if you set it up right from the beginning, like you're saying with a really good application process mm -hmm. where you're really believing in their work and you actually want to partner with them, because that's what yes. I get is you're partnering yes. with them. Right. You, you are becoming their partner in their business. Um, and you preemptively address the potentiality yeah. for resistance, for them wanting to kill you, yeah. um, you know, <laughs> metaphorically, of course, um, and for them wanting to sabotage so they don't have to pay the money. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one big risk that you have to look for. You don't know yet what's going to happen, but one big risk I want you to look for ahead of time and mitigate is the potentiality that as they get closer to success mm -hmm. and having to pay you, yeah some of their old behaviors might come in hmm. that if you pre proactively and preemptively address those behaviors, the, call them out, bring them mm. from shadow into light mm. that you can head that off at the pass. Yeah. And really that's something that a good partner would do anyway. Right. And so I'll just, you know, suggest that maybe you can incorporate that into the model and I, I do notice that we are uh, at the top of the hour yeah. and I wanted to keep this an hour. Yeah. I want to keep this series going. I yeah. think that this is, um, I, I hope it's really valuable for people who are in this conversation in their own heads mm. to be able to hear us talking about it. Yeah. We've got, we've got some answers, not, mm. not all of them. We're, we're still in process. And I, I think even yeah. the answers are experimental. That's right. <laughs> That's right. And you know, George's, uh, his model is more one-on-one. -on -one. He wants to find a way to offer his content in the sustainable generosity, reciprocal gratitude model that he's laid out. I'm not doing any one-on-one. -on -one. Everything I do is big group programs, um, memberships, coaching, selling uh, products that range from $500 now up to, you know, let's say 2,500 for a product. Mm -hmm. Although I did just um, create my first $47 product, which I'm excited about. See how that goes. I've never sold low price products. So we'll see how that goes. Yeah. Um, and I, I'm, I'm curious to see how over this series, we influence each other, yeah. perhaps come um, more towards each other mm -hmm. and find a sustainable way to give our joint gifts in the world. We each have our gifts yeah. in a way that can allow more people to have efficacy of message, recognize that maybe you don't really need the high production value. I mean, here we are with zero production <laughs> Zoom. I'm in my bedroom, yeah. in his office. Yeah. Uh, and, um, and then ultimately be able to build a community of heartfelt people mm. who do know how to ask for what they need yeah. in exchange for what they have to give in mm. a really clean way mm -hmm. that 
um, doesn't just put profit first, but does understand that money is a fuel yeah. for our creative yeah. dreams and our heart projects. I am so looking forward to this. I, this has been such a rich hour. <laughs> Uh, I think I'm going to be listening to this again myself so that I can okay. um, let, uh, let the inquiry um, swim around and uh, bring me, bring my um, way of doing business to a, to a higher level. Like you said, tr transcend and include. Yes. Transcend and include. Great. Well, we'll be back again um, yeah. with another one of these no production value conversations, <laughs> <laughs> but hopefully lots of really great, inquiry for you content to help you choose ultimately the right income model for your life and mm -hmm. and uh, and do the very best you can to um make the right choices not because you were sold something right um that's not right for you but because you truly know yourself and the life that you want to live and the way that you want to deliver your work in the world yeah beautiful Thanks, Thank you, Alex. George. Really this is so you. great. And I look forward to next time. Sounds good.